please turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians 13. We've been working our way through this passage on biblical love now for several weeks. And today we come to verse 7. Verse 7. But what I'm going to do is I'll read the whole passage up to verse 7 so you'll get an idea of where we are. Very famous passage, many of you all uh, will have familiarity with this. Um, even in pictures you'll see on the walls, uh, you will see these words uh, in, in cards, Hallmark cards. So they find their way onto home decor. Uh, but these are very convicting words. Uh, they were not just meant to give us uplifting thoughts of love. They're often read in weddings. But boy, if people knew exactly what they were being called to, they would be challenged convicted about what the love of Christ is like and what we are being called to love like him. Starting at verse 1 of chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things hopes all things, endures all things. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather in this place as a family, as a body, and celebrate your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for Christmas. We're thankful that we're able to think back on when he entered into the world, the point in history when God took on flesh and became a man like us, living in this world and then dying in this world, for the sins of people like us. We are sinners this morning. We declare it. And we also declare that we need the Lord Jesus to save us. And we're thankful that you sent him here to do that very thing. To go to a cross. To be nailed to that and to suffer in our place so that we do not have to receive your judgment. That is what Christmas is all about. We thank you Lord for his resurrection. That he was raised from the grave. That death could not hold him. That he raised himself up and now is seated in the heavenly places and will someday come back for his people that he loves. And that's us. Gathered here in this church, this church and in churches across our country and across this world today, worshiping our Savior. And we pray, Lord, that everything that we have done and everything that we will do in this place this morning brings honor and glory to Jesus Christ. And so we turn our attention to your word and we ask God that your spirit would instruct us on what love truly is. Teach us what Christ's love is like, your love is like for us, Heavenly Father. And please make us to be more like him. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. About a week ago, on uh, one of those strangely warm days that we had outside, um, myself and the three youngest kids, we decided we were going to go out and decorate our house with Christmas lights, probably like some of you all did because it was so nice outside. And one of my daughters had the desire to, for the very first time, to go out and wrap the front tree. We got one tree, you know, here in the city. We get our, our, our tree there in the very front out close to the sidewalk. She wanted to wrap that with Christmas lights. And so she and the other ones go out there and they managed to get it up the tree and around one of the branches. And uh, they decided they wanted to plug in the lights just to be able to test them. And they discovered as they did that that they were no longer able to reach up and grab the lights. And so two of the children stacked themselves on top of one another down on the ground. And the other child proceeded to climb up them like steps so that she could reach up in the tree and grab that cord. I was amused. But in thinking about this text, where we've been and where we are currently here in 1 Corinthians 13, I realized that there was something instructive for us in the actions of my children that day. We are incapable of reaching this kind of love on our own. 
It's too high. Our natural love is just a mere shadow of what we see here. Now, it occasionally resembles God's love. It'll imitate it. It'll call itself by the same name. But what the world calls love stems from natural ability, and it is detached from Christ. And men and women, they are indeed made in the image of God, so we should expect to see a trace of God's love in those who have been made by him, though it's stained by sin. But because it is separated from the Lord, it cannot reach the heights of biblical love that pleases him. This kind of love that he calls us to, it requires that his spirit be in us, empowering what we would not, empowering what we could not, cannot do on our own. And so what we require to be able to love like what we see here in 1 Corinthians 13, it requires the work of God. It requires the supernatural to take place in us, to carry us along, to love like Jesus. And so there is a standard of love that we are being called to, we need to understand this morning, that we cannot reach on our own. And I hope that over the last several weeks, as we have been in this passage, that you have felt a kind of insufficiency, an inability to reach what we've seen here. And if not... If all that we've talked about here in these verses has seemed very easy to you, one of two things has happened. Either you have way too high a view of your ability to love like Jesus, or I have done a very poor job of explaining the text. Because this is challenging. It's meant to be challenging. It's not meant to seem simple and easy as if you just can go out and do this on your own with with no uh, effort at all whatsoever. It requires that you are continually abiding in Jesus Christ. And so before we started um, this passage of Scripture, so back early in the fall, we were looking uh, at the I am statements of Jesus. And the last one we looked at was from John chapter 15, where we're told we must abide in the vine to be able to bear his fruit. So this kind of love is a fruit of abiding in the Lord Jesus. And if you are not abiding in him, you can rest assured that you are not loving like him. It's impossible. Every now and then again, it'll look something like it, but it will not be the love of Jesus Christ flowing through you. And so I hope that you have felt this insufficiency during these weeks. That is a good thing because it means that you will learn to depend on Jesus to be able to love like him. That's my hope this morning for the text that we're going to look at. We're in verse 7. And Paul is beginning to wrap up his talk in the details of Christian love. And what he says here appears to all belong together because of the repetition of the words all things. So if you notice there in verse 7, he says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So those those words, all things, tell us that these words, these four things, they do hang together. He's about to move on to the next verse to tell us how love will last forever in heaven. But before he does, he wants us to understand that true love is strong. It's strong. That's what he's getting at here in verse 7. God's love for you is strong. It cannot be broken by anything that happens in your life. But because we're also given the love of God, our love begins to be like his too. And our love becomes strong like God's. When the world talks about love, it's often sappy. It's squishy. Feelings-based. Primarily romantic. But it is a love that does not hold up under the pressures of the world. And there are a lot of pressures out there, aren't there? Squeezing you, pressing down on you. That's why you'll so often hear that two people fell out of love. Their love, whatever it was, did not hold up under pressure. 
And so it caved in. It dissipated. It disappeared. It's because they had a wrong understanding of love. When feelings change, what happens? Feelings change and we think that love then is gone because we primarily think of love as a feeling. But here in this text, it tells us that love is so often, biblically speaking, an action. It is what we choose to do. We will it. We overcome feelings. Often they're a hindrance to our ability to truly love. We don't feel like it, so we won't. That's not God's love. Do you think that God loved you because you were so lovable? Do you think he had butterflies in his stomach and couldn't help but love us? No, God chose to set his love on us in Christ. He he desired and delighted to have a people for himself, so God did love us in the sending of his son. He didn't have to. He wasn't compelled to. He wanted to. It rose up from within himself, not by looking out here in us and saying, oh, they're so cuddly and lovable. I can't do anything without them. No, it was inside of his own heart. And God chose to love us. And his love is strong. And the words that Paul gives to us here, they all represent a particular element of this strength. And I want you to think of love in three different categories or three different ways that love gets directed. Number one, God's love for us. God loves us. It flows from him to us. And because God's love flows from him to us, we then have his love in us. And it flows back to him. So when we read about the love of God, we understand the love of God, what Christ has done for us, we love him in return. We loved him because he first loved us. That's what the scripture teaches. But then we also love other people with that same love. And that's primarily what Paul is getting at here in these verses. It's how we get along inside of churches. It's how we get along inside of families and in communities. The love of Christ binds us together. We begin to love people with what he has given to us. So that's the three ways that love gets directed. And here in verse 7, we get four descriptions of what this love is like. And it's really four descriptions of a kind of strength that God's love for us has and then we have for him and others. So we read, love bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And I do not plan to teach how each one of these descriptions of love fits into all three categories. This is going to be a little bit of mix and match. But I hope that along the way that you'll be helped to understand better how God loves you and how you are called to reciprocate his love back to him, but then also how God desires for you to love other people. I'm only going to deal with two of these today. And so if I start to go long, I want to make sure I say that. You're like, oh, no, he's still got two to go. Like just two today, love bears all things and love believes all things. First, I'm going to say it this way, that love always protects. Love always protects. And that's how the NIV, if you happen to have an NIV Bible, it's how it renders these words that I read earlier, love bears all things. I think this seems to be a better sense of the word. Because this word often is used to represent a roof that covers a dwelling place that does not allow water to get inside. Or even the hull of a ship that is watertight and allows a boat to get out there and float without sinking. Another way of saying this is is that love covers all things. It resists all things. Meaning it does not expose or reveal Love is not quick to reveal the faults of others. It does not take any pleasure in attacking somebody else's character. It doesn't want to expose anything that would bring shame on another person. What does a child do? They, they are quick to tattle, are they not? They like to tell on the other kids. They see something wrong, and man, they want you to know immediately. You must know. John did such and such. It wants to expose. They love to expose, it seems. 
But love will be quick to cover over the faults of somebody else, to shield from hurt. Think about when a family has a scandal, maybe a public scandal even. And often what you'll see is that family rallies around one another. They close ranks. They don't want any information getting out there. They try to make it tight so that no shame comes upon the family member who has sinned or erred in some way. That's what a family does. And so often the public thinks they have a right to know everything that took place and what happened and all this and that. But love wants to protect those family members and keep it locked up tight. A biblical example is the scene of the drunken Noah. Do you all know that story? We often hear about how Noah it was in the ark in the boat, right? But after the flood subsided, Noah planted a vineyard and he got drunk. And he laid there naked there at the edge of his tent. And one of his sons desired to expose him. But the other two sons, they covered him and didn't want him to even be seen at all. And so they, they didn't want to look at him himself, so they walked him backwards into the tent. Those two sons protected their father, covered him. The other son wanted to expose him. Which sons showed their father love? And so the default setting of love is to shield from harm, not to poke holes in a person, but to cover over those holes, cast somebody in the best possible light. And so love is not judgmental, it's not quick to judge, not quick to point out, it's quick to generosity. As you think on the Lord this morning, how has he treated you with the love of Christ? Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay for our sins. And because he did that, what is God's disposition toward you now? Is he quick to poke holes in you? Does he handle you roughly? As you read God's word, is he quick to cast you in the worst possible light? How does he speak about you? We're told that he remembers our sins no more. That he cast them as far away as the east is from the west. That there is no longer any condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Because in Christ our sins are hidden. They're covered over by his blood. In Christ we're protected, watertight. No more shame, no more guilt. It doesn't mean that we don't feel guilty when we sin, because we do, right? But when we bring those to the Lord Jesus, we're told that we are cleansed, that he's faithful and just to do that as we look to him in faith, that our sins no longer belong to us. They are under the blood of Jesus Christ. He took them upon himself, and they are no longer ours. So guilt and shame aren't ours anymore in an ultimate sense as we stand before God. He looks at us and declares us not guilty because of his son. God is not quick to poke holes in us. He sees us now in Christ and delights in us. His judgment will no longer extend to where his generosity is now reached. And if you know Jesus Christ, his generosity has extended to you, and judgment is not yours anymore. And when that generous, protecting, covering, resisting kind of love has reached our hearts, that begins to change the way that we treat other people. We often think of viruses as bad, and I guess in this world they are, but I guess the way that I was thinking about this is like this is a good virus in a sense from God, his love. It comes into our hearts, it begins to infect us in a way, and then we begin to pass it along to other people in a wonderful sense. We now prefer to cover over faults rather than expose them. Is that the way that you treat other people? Do you treat them in light of God's love for you?
So as you have conversations or as you hear things about others, are you quick to pass it along? Are you quick to bring judgment? Do you delight to hear those things? Or are you quick to cover them up? That's what love does. It covers over shame and it covers over guilt. That's the first thing. The second way that love is characterized here in a very strong way in this passage is that it is quick to trust. Love is quick to trust. And when you hear this, don't think gullible. Well, she just believes everything she hears. Can't do that. That wouldn't be wise. And in a sense, that's true. That's not what this, that's not what Paul is describing here. But love will tend to trust before it doubts. It wants to believe well of people unless it's proven otherwise. It prefers to take a person's word for it. I used to watch the show Pawn Stars. How many of you all have seen that before? I think a number of you have. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that the guy, when he was examining something that somebody brought in, he would always say, you know, it's not that I don't trust you, I just don't trust anybody. And in his line of business, I get it. But if that's the way that you carry yourself in every situation, especially with people in the church, you're not truly loving. Of all people, Christians believe in the sinfulness of man. They understand that the world has fallen. They know the world is full of liars. But that does not mean that we have to carry ourselves with a critical spirit in every conversation. We're not going to be quick to be suspicious, always suspicious of everybody's motives around us, always thinking the worst of people until they prove themselves good. No, love should do the opposite. In last night's play, Scrooge was once a cynical and pessimistic man. He was quick to accuse, doubt the intentions of all the people that he spoke with. He would have been quick to believe evil gossip spoken of another man and doubtful of any good that he heard. But the Christian cannot carry himself like this and think that he is in any way Christ-like. Jesus did not carry himself like that in the world. Yes, he knew what was in man. But he didn't walk around like that and talk to everybody with a suspicious voice. I know what's in you. You're a wicked soul. No. Jesus spoke kindly, gently, again, casting people in the best possible light until proven otherwise. We do have to be wise as serpents in the world, like Jesus said, but we do need to be also harmless as doves. So brothers and sisters, understand the world that you live in as it really is. We're not called to be Pollyannas. We do recognize the reality of evil, but we don't let it infect the way that we treat or think of other people unless they give us a reason to do so. And if they do, and often they will, look back at point number one. Our desire, if they do, must still be as best as we can to cover over their shame and their guilt. We do call to repentance. We do call sin what it is. But we need to do so in the most shielding, protective way possible, the most Jesus-glorifying way possible. No delight should come in us by finding sin. Love rejoices to point people to their Savior. And then not to expose that person to any more ridicule than the littlest amount possible. This is strong love. It's actually very easy to go in the opposite direction, isn't it? It's just really easy to just tear a person apart. We all can do that. But do you see why this requires self-control, strength? When you even have a, a right, in a sense, to accuse somebody and tear them down, but to refuse to do so. Instead, to be gentle and handle them kindly. Cast them again in a good light as best as you can. Not to toss them out there to the wolves to shred apart. Seems like everybody in our world loves to do that. 
feel empowered when they can do that. But this right here requires the power of Jesus Christ. Turn them to their Savior, absolutely. Call them to repentance and faith in Him. Expose them to Him while their sins are being exposed, but not to go out there and broadcast it to everybody else. Keep it as contained as possible when you do find it. This is strong love. And it's strong because it resists all those evil impulses, evil thoughts, evil intentions. Love is going to believe the best that it can in a world that is quick to doubt. And so again, I ask you, as you walk around in your community, maybe as you go to work, when you first meet people, how do you carry yourself? Are you more quick to trust, give the benefit of the doubt? Are you quick to start tearing apart in your mind? Are you judgmental, even before they give you reason to be? And does that carry over with the way that you treat people inside the church of Jesus Christ? Families aren't supposed to do that. And we are a family here, are we not? We've been bound together by the love of Jesus. And this is what it looks like. I've got one other potential application here. I think this will probably resonate with some of you. It's that our, our sinful nature is often quick to distrust God. To be quick to think the worst of Him. And so when hard circumstances come into your life, whatever that might look like, poor health, bad run of financial problems, relationships that have gone sour, just general disappointment. It's been a bad year. Nothing ever seems to go my way. If some of those things are happening with you, you might begin to doubt his goodness. Think that he no longer thinks about you anymore. That he no longer cares about you. Start to believe that he is somehow powerless to help. He's preoccupied with some other concern. He's busy over there and he can't see me. And you might not even articulate any of this in your mind, but you just begin to slip into a general des despondency with a heart that begins to callous over just little by little over time, you harden. And your trust in him has begun to wane. He never helps. He never listens to me. I don't know if he's even really good, is he? He doesn't have any power to change anything. He's never done anything for me in a powerful way. Is he even real? Now, I won't ask you to raise your hand. And again, I don't know if anybody is going to openly really say those things, but there is something, is there not, that happens inside of our hearts that starts to believe stuff like this when things don't go the way that we want them to. I think we know there's truth to this. You and I need to understand that we are not able to accurately decipher God's character and his ways simply by what happens to us or by what happens in the world. And so as you look at your life, as you look at the world, it does not tell us what God's character is like clearly. That's not where we're supposed to look for those answers. And so if bad things happen to us or out there in the world, and they do, do they not? Not too hard to look around and see that there's plenty of bad out there. Well, when we see those things, it does not mean that God is not good. And nor does it mean that he is incapable of doing anything about it. God's word is the only accurate guide for understanding his character and his purposes. He has revealed himself there to us. And we look to his word to find out who he is and what he is really like, regardless of what is happening in our circumstances. 
And his word tells us that they, we have no reason to doubt him. And so if you find yourself in a place like this, and I have to imagine there are some here this morning who do, do not let your hardships or the work of the powers of darkness cause you to doubt the goodness of God. You have to remember that his ways are above your ways and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so do you have a situation right now in your life that is not going the way that you want it to? As a matter of fact, I have to imagine that everybody in this room, if you're thinking very objectively about your life and all the things that are going on right now, you can find multiple things right now that are not going the way that you would have them to, right? And maybe it's just that one thing. That one thing that whatever it is, that if it were good, that thing, if it were good, you think your whole life would then be good. And you've prayed. Yeah, you've prayed again and again, have you not? And it's as if the heavens are made of brass. And every time you send your prayer up, it's as if the sky is hard and your words just reverberate off the ceiling and come back down to you. Anybody can relate to that? And you start to wonder, does God even love me? Because by the look of my circumstances right now, it sure doesn't look like he loves me. And I don't feel like he loves me. Where do you go? Where do you go when you need a real answer about God's love? Do you go to your circumstances? Boy, I hope not. I hope you go to his word. Because it is there that he reveals his love to you most clearly, does he not? And we need to understand that this place that we live in is not heaven. God has not promised that you will live like you are in heaven here and now. And yes, every now and then he's going to send sweet trinkets of his love to you to shock and amaze you. But that is not all the time, is it? This world will often be a place where his face is hidden. You can't always see him clearly in what he is doing. And you do not look at your circumstances to determine it. Because your eyes will strain to see his steps. And you will at times feel all alone. But his word proves to us that his love will never fail. And he has given us no reason to doubt him. Instead, he has given you every reason to believe that he is good and that you can trust him both now and forever because he has offered up his son for you out of the love that he has for you. This is strong love. And so when you begin to doubt and your circumstances speak to you in a particular way about what you think God is like, you have to look again to the gospel of Jesus Christ to be reminded that he loves you with an everlasting love, a love that sent his son into the world to die for you. What else could God do to prove his love? You want more than that? That's where we look. And every person here in this room has a heart that needs to be reminded of that because often this world will bring failures and disappointments and frustrations. As a matter of fact, every day brings those things to us. So we cannot depend on those things to speak of God's love to us constantly, but the gospel does. His word does. And so if you confess that you believe that God is good then you should, as you look at the gospel, never doubt that everything that he does for you will work in that direction. All that God is doing for you, whether it looks good or bad, all of it is leading to your good, especially your eternal good. He promises that. And so I want to remind you this morning that no matter what you're going through, you can trust it into the Lord's good hands. Be quick to trust him, not quick to doubt. 
even in the bad that happens to you. He is loving you and working that situation for your good. And someday, and there will come a glorious day when you are no longer here in this place of all sorts of hurts and diseases and sadness and death. That day will come for his church. And someday when you're in that place, you will discover how this particular thing, this thing that is a plague upon your life right now, where it does not seem that God will remove this from you, you will be in that wonderful place. You'll reflect back on all that has taken place and how God cared for you in that moment and how he worked that thing for your good there to prepare you for that place. We're often very short-sighted, are we not? We want it our way, and we want it now. But God has a long view of things. We only can see right there in front of us, but God sees every bit. And he sees what you need in heaven with him someday. And that thing that you would have gotten rid of right now in heaven, you will say, oh, I'm glad that God did not. I needed that to prepare me for more joy, more gratitude, more delight in this place where I now reside, and I will rejoice in him forever. Praise God for what he did that I used to call bad, because it was good. Last 12 verses of Romans chapter 8 speak very clear about this. It tells us that God's love is unbreakable. And the people that he wrote this to lived in a hard world. Really, in some ways, a lot harder than where we're currently at right now, that's for sure. There were threats all around them, and they needed to be reminded that God's love would never leave them, no matter what their circumstances looked like. And so we're going to close this morning by just reading those verses, and I hope As I do read those, they'll be on the screen if you don't have a Bible in front of you. That your heart will be encouraged to believe in the love of God given to you in Christ Jesus. It is strong love. And it will sustain and overrule and overpower everything that comes into your life. He even says death itself is stronger than that. And we all need to be reminded of that very thing. This is what Paul writes. He says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brothers and sisters... When you begin to doubt, this is where you go. This is the compass that points us back to truth. Our feelings, our circumstances, they are sure, sure to lead us astray, but God's word will not. Do you want to know that God loves you? Look at Jesus Christ. He is all you need. Heavenly Father, this morning, We thank you for your amazing love. 
And I pray, Father, that in this room right now that you are impacting hearts to look to Jesus Christ and see the love of a Father who delights to open up his arms to all who will come to him, who see his Son as wonderful. Give us eyes to see your love, and I pray, Lord, that you will increase our love for you and for other people based on what you have done for us. Change us to be like Jesus. We look forward to heaven. We look forward to a place where there is not sadness and brokenness and disappointment and abuse and injustice and all a host of a number of other evil things will not be there. We look forward to that day. But you tell us that in this world, because you have overcome sin, that you will overcome it in our hearts and empower your people to love like you have. May you do that through this church this week, even today, even in this room right now. That as we go back to our homes even and have opportunity to be quick to distrust people around us, quick to poke holes in those people that are around us, Lord, that we will show them the love of Jesus and they will be drawn to a wonderful Savior who has a, an otherworldly, alien love. It is strange to the people in this world but it is a wonderful love that draws people to Christ. May we represent that in the world that you have given us to live in until you call us home. We thank you for this time together in your word. Do your work, Holy Spirit, in our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, before we close, we're going to take three minutes. And it really is just a few minutes for you to do business with the Lord and think on his word. Ask him to give you this kind of love in your